it became clear to me that um, you know in a lot of developing countries, in particular, fish is the the main protein, uh, one of the main livelihoods, um, and of course, you know, we've heard over the last two decades nothing but kind of dire stories about overfishing and depletion of the resource. So I really was trying to figure out where are the fish going to come from to feed a growing world, and. Um, and as I got into it, I realized that a lot of the, pe the perceptions that people have about the state of fisheries uh, are based on things that were happening in the 1990s. Nicholas P. Sullivan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media. Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Lojas Regenerative Foundation. Nicholas is a writer and editor focusing on the impact of business and technology on international development. The Blue Revolution, his fourth book, what we're here to talk about today. I'm sorry I don't have a physical copy to hold up. It's fresh and hot off the press. Just barely has been released by Island Press. It follows money. Real quick, Kenya's disruptive mobile money innovation. You can hear um, Nicholas speak about how micro loans and cell phones are connecting the world's poor to the global economy and computer power for small business. He has been a co-director of the Fletcher School of Leadership Program for Financial Inclusions, Tufts by Tufts University, a consultant to central banks in developing countries and a visiting scholar at MIT's Lakatum Center for International Development. In the publishing world, he, he was a publisher of Innovations, Technology, Governance, Globalization, MIT Press, Editor-in-Chief of Inc.com and Editor-in-Chief of Home Office Computing. Nicholas is currently a senior fellow at the Fletcher Schools Council on Emerging Market Enterprise and senior research fellow at its Maritime Studies program. Nicholas has twice been a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center resident fellow, a graduate of Harvard University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He lives in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Welcome to the podcast, mm -hmm. Nicholas. It's so nice to have you. I'm sure I could go on, on and on, on your biography, you've, you've been around the block uh, and seen quite a bit. Yeah, that's quite a mouthful. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. And um, thank you for uh, inviting me on your uh, illustrious uh, podcast. It's a treat. Thank you very much. I'm so glad it, it worked out. There was some uh, struggles or originally with mm. my, my traveling and that we were mm. able to coordinate it and, and really make it work. Um, I deal a lot with, with food, with uh, food systems and global things. And the thing that has always been lacking over the years is really that knowledge about what's going on in the seas, you know, and, and even in, in the environmental circles, we usually talk about airplanes and we talk about what's going on on the land, but there's not a lot of discussion in depth uh, that comes out what's happening on on the seas and fisheries and, and uh, the whole industry. And so mm. I really loved your book. I, I, I didn't get a physical copy because I'm in Hamburg, Germany, but I read the digital copy twice. And I, I want you to know just to thank you. It's fabulous. It's, it's right in, in the direction that, that I love to read about. One, and, and I'll, I'm going to get to the question soon, but because you um, are really taking kind of a new angle or twist than, than most other books around seafood or fisheries and, and what's going on. It's really about this almost a digital transformation, the data and the revolution and what new technologies and what innovations and from your past of writing and things, there's a lot of innovation there as well. So it, it doesn't surprise me, but I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. And, and most people don't know six of the major Re things that we need to do, transformations, transitions, uh, in order to achieve them and the Paris Agreement 
uh, are really key factors to get us there. And one of them uh, is this digital transformation, this information age and, the, and, and how we understand it and we use it properly. And that's really what the heart of your book addresses so much. So um, I want to start out slow and, and kind of get everybody up to speed and then get into more depth and substance as we go along in our conversation. What led you to, to address these and to dive into this type of a publication? Well, I, um, you know, as you no noted in my um, bio, most of my recent work has been on international development in um, financial inclusion, um, you know, starting with the spread of cell phones through South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and then um, which morphed in for people who never had phones were now able to conduct business by phone. And then that morphed into uh, mobile money. People who never had phones or bank accounts were sending money uh, over their phones. And <clears throat> so that led to you know, cons consulting work with central banks and other groups um, trying to get more people into the banking system. And a lot of the work that I was doing, I was through um, USAID, Agency for International Development. And every place you would go, they would always have, you know, they would be working on food security issues as well as finance and economic issues. So um, it became clear to me that, um, you know, in a lot of developing countries, in particular, fish is the, the main protein, uh, one of the main livelihoods. Um, and of course, you know, we've heard over the last two decades, nothing but kind of dire stories about overfishing and depletion of the resource. So I really was trying to figure out where are the fish gonna come from to feed a growing world? And, um, and as I got into it, I realized that a lot of the, pe the perceptions that people have about the state of fisheries uh, are based on things that were happening in the 1990s, <clears throat> the incredible overfishing and the depletion of some kind of iconic <clears throat> stocks like the Atlantic cod um, and the Norwegian uh, salmon farming, which had all kinds of negative environmental effects. But in the last 20 years or so, there's been really a major shift, a behavioral shift, policy shift toward more <clears throat> sustainable, restorative, um, you know, wild capture and farming techniques. So I was trying to tell that story. And of course I had done, you know, through Inc. Magazine and, uh, you know, working on entrepreneurship, a lot of <clears throat> written about the impact of technology on society and business and individuals. And of course I could see some of that stuff happening in fishing as well, but technology seeping into the industry a little bit later than some of the other industries like, you know, say car manufacturing has been kind of automated for quite a while and service industries, highly automated or, you know, digitized. <clears throat> but fishing was always a throwback industry <clears throat> that is now um, really beginning to change. So that's uh, kind of the origin of the story. Love it. And I, I think it's, it's, it's really vital. So the, the full title of the book is The Blue Revolution, Hunting, Harvesting, and Farming Seafood in the Information Age. And so, um, you know, if you, a lot of people tend to judge books by the cover. So they're like, you know, oh, okay, this is all about, uh, you know, these things. But it's really some of the things that are emerging and, and why they're emerging because of some illegal and, and crazy things going on, on in our oceans and our waterways that are that are pretty eye-opening. And you tell a few of those stories in, in the book. I, um, just for a full open transparency, I, I'm on the sustainable advisory board of a new uh, kind of a blockchain-based company that ha has a big contract with uh, one of Germany's largest seafood companies to try to get that traceability in there through distributed ledger technology, the blockchain, these smart contracts, where they actually do it from catch to the freezer is kind of their motto is catch to the freezer. The company's called Our, Ours. And um, it's just uh, very interesting to see how necessary that is and how vital some, some of these things are, this open and transparency and to kind of see 
you know, is this sustainably harvest or sustainably caught seafood? Is it really what the package says it is and things? That, and those are some, some really important things. And so every chapter, there's 13 chapters in your book broken up into three parts. It's really kind of the, not only a nice journey, but these nice stories of different areas of, of, of what's going on. And I love the fact that um, you, 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 you break it down into these stories. And one of the ones that really caught my eye was about some, some, the illegal thing, I get, I think you call them the Godfather. Oh, the, the Godfather. The Codfather. The Codfather in New Bedford, yes. <laughs> yeah, the Codfather yeah. in New Bedford. And uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd just love to hear in your own voice if, you, if you'd tell us a little bit about, you know, some of those illegal things and, and why that almost kind of pushes into why we need some new systems, some new models in, in, in the industry to kind of avoid that. Well, yeah, the, the Codfather, his name is uh, Carlos Rafael, who was a um, uh, Portuguese immigrant, very successful fisher, owned uh, more than 40 boats. And um, <clears throat> what he was doing and eventually kind of uh, entrapped by um, FBI undercover investigators was, you know, misreporting his catch, mislabeling his catch, not... Um, uh, accounting or uh, for the money he was making and um, all of which was illegal because you're supposed to obviously adhere to certain quotas for each stock and label the fish for what they are and report the, um, the landings and so forth. But he, he had not only his own boats, but his own processing facility. So he was able to go, he was able to kind of sidestep a lot of the uh, oversight. And um, so he was, you know, trapped by these, you know, undercover investigators who, you know, the truth came out and then he was, you know, tried and convicted, did four years in jail and uh, is now out. But so I, I use him as, he's a colorful figure obviously. And, um, but I use him as kind of a, a pivot point of the, the end of one era or the old era, the old uh, cowboy of the sea era in fishing, at least in New England, where I'm focusing the book, or in lots of you know lots of parts of the world with this, and <clears throat> so he is giving way to a, new, a kind of a new breed, a new behavior, a new way of thinking about um, uh, behavior and policy, and of course you know fishermen are not, you know, like anyone is gonna, they're going to get away with whatever they can get away with, <laughs> but um, there are more and more, um, you know, constraints and oversight and regulations uh, that are helping manage the fish. And of course, I say a couple of times that the um, the last 20 years have been better for the fish than for the fishermen, <laughs> because the new policies and regulations and catch quotas, which have been <clears throat> in the U.S. at least and many parts of Europe and Scandinavia and even South America, um, New Zealand, Australia have been very well managed. Um, it's resulted in a kind of consolidation of the industry. <clears throat> there are fewer boats, far fewer boats. Um, the boats are more expensive. It's much harder for younger people to get into the business and so forth. So it's been pretty rough on fishermen, but it's been pretty good for the resource because a lot of stocks have been rebuilt. And in the US, 45 stocks that were overfished in 2000 have now been rebuilt. And um, there, there are others that are in the rebuilding phase. But um, so all, all that has been uh, a positive. And, you know, it clearly is not happening everywhere in the world. And there's a lot of illegal fishing on the high seas. And um, but even that is getting more um, becoming more transparent with um, satellite data. And um, there's this group called Global Fishing Watch. I don't know if you know them that um, shows satellite yeah. maps of all the boats uh, on the sea and you know, real time, basically. And you can tell who's fishing where and so forth. And that has led to a lot of um, apprehension and ar arrests of illegal fishermen on the high sea. Yeah, so, that's it. 
it's a super well, project and i love yeah. i love that there's a couple of sites like that as well not just on fishing but also on um ship movement in general mm. and mm. just unidentified ships uh, you know they do, they sort them by colors and they also container ships and how much has moved on the seas it's, it's really interesting to see it's almost like you know um this this unbelievable map of who's got a license who's unknown who's really illegal who's in areas mm -hmm. of water that are off limits and what are they doing there in real time it's unbelievable yeah and the you know the obviously the the problem with um policing the ocean is that it's you know 70 percent of the planet and um you know they're <clears throat> interpol the international you know police have, I, I don't know how many boats they have, but it's not that many. Uh, sea Shepherd and some other NGO type organizations again. Um, <clears throat> but I think, you know, you had mentioned earlier, we were talking about the regional kind of um, maritime organizations that are kind of bonding to, um, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's a couple on, on both, the, I think one on the East Coast and West Coast of Africa. There's one, I think in uh, the East Coast of South America, Brazil, um, Uruguay and Argentina have bonded together. There's one in the Western Pacific of you know small nations that are really kind of bonding <clears throat> together to police their own ocean. <clears throat> uh, I love Excuse I me. love that fact mm. um, that that we do have that policing, but it would be nice if we could get mm. some technology and systems in place that uh fishermen and, and industrial scale fisher fisheries or, or uh, fish mongering and and all of that the catch industry would use different practices and so it, it's really in the in the same chapter the chapter we're talking about is chapter three um the cowboys on the high sea almost you know this um is it possible to fish at an industrial scale in a post-industrial mode, you know, mm -hmm. um, I know there's blue harvest fisheries out there and, and mm -hmm. some other uh, post-industrial fleets, but is it possible? <clears throat> well, I think one of the things that makes it, you know, I, <clears throat> I do say that it's shifting from industrial to post-industrial. And, <clears throat> and what I mean by industrial is that basically there's no regard for anything except maximizing the catch, maximizing the profit, and so forth. So there's no regard for any external uh, neg negative impact on you know, the resource or the habitat. So yeah, it is possible. I mean, one, one way is just to avoid um, you know, unwanted bycatch. If you're just trawling you know, r r uh, randomly and pulling up everything, <clears throat> a lot of the fish you're not gonna want, it's not gonna be high value. Uh, it's going to get tossed overboard. And um, so that has basically been stopped in the last 20 years. Um, <clears throat> with, you know, not totally stopped, but so I think that that makes a big difference because it's not, it's just not, you're not just catching everything in your net and keeping only the value stuff. You're targeting <clears throat> the valued species that you're after. And you know, working within limits and, um, you know, reporting the catch um, to the regulators when you're still at sea before you land. <clears throat> and then there are, you know, people on the docks, you know, environmental police, fishing regulators, you know, checking the, the catch and the load to see if it conforms to the um, stated uh, catch that you phoned in. So I, yeah, I do think it's I do think it's possible, and um, you know there 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 are better um, you know freezing and chilling systems on boats now, which is obviously an expensive investment, <laughs> but it means that um, the catch is better handled and arrives on shore in better shape, and um, so <clears throat> again, it's kind of respecting the resource and, and increasing the value of the catch. 
I have a bunch of questions, so I'm glad you brought up by by catch, and I want to <clears> I want to <throat> go a little bit more into that. And um, I, matter of fact, I was just looking here um, because I have a by catch device that is I will I want to show you that it's really fabulous. Um, shoot, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's a it's a device that. It was based on lighting. There was an old uh, 1913 paper written by a professor who did some uh, research that all fish types species see a different light spectrum. Mm. They're attracted or detracted to a different light spectrum. And, um, and that was an old paper that some new innovators and some new people who were trying to um, solve some challenges around our oceans read and said how could we use this to reduce bycatch and they came up with this lighting system that is integrated in the nets that have um, lights for escape holes for certain size of fish that they don't want to catch um, and that it doesn't attract those that they do want to keep in the net and um, just this this cool lighting system, and it's really a, a great thing that's reduced bycatch down to one percent, so of, of unwanted uh, product. Because I, I assume so, the, the the industrial agriculture on land, the monoculture is not working for us anymore. But how does the bycatch, where we're just grabbing anything that gets into the net, and then uh, I know in, in Europe, there are some laws and regulations that it, whatever they catch, they can't throw the rest back overboard, that they have to somehow keep it mm -hmm. or use it, that, 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 that release. There's some laws and regulations about that. What is that like in the U U.S. and how complicated is that, that entire system, not only with what they're doing with the nets, but how can they really control all that bycatch that they get in there and, and and is, is bycatch another word for waste, food waste, or how, how does that work? Can you explain well, that? Well, yeah, it has been um, another, it has been wasted <clears throat> food, really, because it's fine, typically been thrown overboard and, you know, some of them survive, and but most of them, I think, don't. And, um, but, you know, to your point about the, with the lights, I was uh, unaware of that, but there's certainly all kinds of new nets that are designed to let certain uh, species um, escape the trawl net. You know, and certain fish swim up when they hit a net and other fish swim down. Um, certain fish fit through certain ring size. So you, you can, they are making adjustments in the, in the, in the gear to allow fish to escape. They've, there's been experiments with, um, you know, you talk about the lights underwater, but the cameras underwater that are sending images up to the um, to the pilot's um, computer with machine learning, so you can tell, you know, what kind of fish are going into the net, what's what size, what species, and so forth, and so <clears throat> it gives you more kind of a sense of what's going on underneath the ocean underneath the surface of the water and allows you to adjust on the fly. So, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is, um, you know, being newly introduced and obviously, you know, it's an expense to change gear, to add gear, to, you know, design new gear, <clears throat> but it's, um, you know, it's all part of the kind of more of a post-industrial mode where we're not gonna just suck everything up and of course, you know, in the high seas, there are all these UN regulations on against drift nets that capture everything from turtles, sharks, um, puffin, and you know, albatross, everything. And uh, this is awful. Or long lines that go for miles and miles and miles that hook everything. And um, that's a different story than the, uh, <clears throat> you know, fishing on the continental shelf. So the continental shelf is where most fish are found. But of course, some of the high value fish, the tuna, the sharks, or the migratory species that are out in the, the high seas. And <clears throat> so stopping the bycatch on the high seas is um, a little still kind of a wild west with the long lines and the drift nets and, and so forth. 
Uh, yeah, I appreciate you you going in and sorry, I didn't mean to be rude, but I usually have that device right mm. next to me and I wanted <laughs> to show it to you because it was actually, um, I, I worked uh, with a foundation for a long time that invested in um, innovations for purpose that solve some form of a global grand challenge. And one of them was this bycatch. And, and um, I actually have a, a, a working model that they gave me because we would talk about it a lot. And so I, I wanted to show it to you. I, I wrote a book as well it's called The Beauty of Impact Health. And they they were mm -hmm. uh, in, in that book as well. And there are a lot uh, more than, you know, uh, in the last 10, 15 years that have really emer emerged uh, on the scene to help to reduce bycatch because it's the it's the waste of the sea and you know even if they're throwing it back in the oceans or whatever the regulations are in the spots where they're fishing uh most of that 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 bycatch that's then thrown back is dead anyway and it's just a horrible thing for the ecosystem uh, of our oceans and, and uh, creates it creates a huge number of problems but there are some other methods if they do get it on board, how, how do they report it properly? How do they uh, label it and divide it so that nothing's wasted so that it's kept in and, and sold off to eat or, or used in some way if we are gonna kill these animals or these fish. Um, so, I, I mean, that, that for me is really, really a big aspect of it. There, there is another thing that, you know, in that same discussion is not only is there various monitoring systems to monitor the uh, catch quotas and effectiveness, but there's also, you know, sometimes a difference between what's caught on the open sea and what's then reported or unloaded at the docks. And how, how does that happen? It's just another illegal portion of, mm, of what's, mm. what's going on. Is that, is that how I understand mm. it? Because there's not enough traceability? Well, you know, one thing they're starting to um, use now is electronic monitoring so that you can, <clears throat> you have electronic monitors on the boats so you can rather than having human observers on the boats, you can see from the shore what is really being caught. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends where you, what part of the world you're in, you know, you know, and um, a lot of the stuff that I think you're talking about is from the, you know, illegal unreported um, fishing and, you know, where that, where that fish is landed, is unknown. I think ports in Asia, maybe in China, and there's probably less restrictions there than there are in some other more um, developed uh, fishing nations. So it really, I think <clears throat> it's kind of um, a tale of two cities, really, <laughs> and, you know, and, and how fish are handled and treated. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the basic um, trend is positive. And it's, it's also true for the farmed fish, you know? I mean, in, it, it, there used to be this kind of saying that friends don't eat, don't let friends eat farm fish because it's bad. And, but um, I heard someone from the Nature Conservancy head of aquaculture the other day, which is focusing on, you know, shellfish and kelp, which is quite restorative to waters, doesn't use food and so forth. And he said that 70% of the marine aquaculture or mariculture now is shellfish and kelp, which is, you know, very healthy for the oceans. So, and as far as the near shore farming that was going on in um, Norway in the nineties, that has kind of shifted into either land-based farming of finfish or offshore farming in colder, deeper, waters with swifter currents. So there's less of the, you know, degradation of the seafloor, of buildup of sea lice and all those issues that were prevalent in the 90s. And, um, and of course, the other big issue that environmentalists and biologists rightly complained about in the early days of, um, you know, industrial aquaculture was the um, use of forage fish like you know, herring, menhaden, shad, capelin, and so forth, to 
for fish meal and fish oil to feed farm fish. So people are saying, why are you robbing the ocean of these forage fish that, you know, wild fish eat to, to you know, feed farm fish? And of course now, you know, so the ratio of wild, <clears throat> of feed to um, farm fish used to be like five to one. It's now more a one to one. And <clears throat> there are other, you know, alternatives. There are soy alternatives. There are single cell protein alternatives. So there's less and less of the forage fish being used for that. So that's another kind of major shift in um, you know, global farming practices. I mean, how would you, there's, and I, I wanna talk about more on this chapter as well, um, but there, there is this you know, big green revolution, but how does that compare to the blue revolution? You know? uh, and, and, the, there's also this controversy between the, the actual farmers or uh, in the oceans and and the science behind it what the scientists are saying and mm. how do those two worlds are they merging together how are they playing together and what do you see emerging well i think again it depends where you are in the world i mean in you know places like china they've been farming for centuries and um Still, that by far the I think that sixty percent of the world's aquaculture is from China, and uh, most of it actually is um, freshwater, not saltwater. And I've to look just at um, saltwater. So the you know the green revolution you know in um, the sixties and seventies started in Mexico and then India and, and parts of Asia was you know just increased wheat and rice yields by two or three times through irrigation and fertilizers and so forth. But eventually they kept, you know, ended up degrading the soil despite the increase because they used, they planted the same crops in the same places year after year after year. And then the blue revolution, which started in India in the eighties and in other parts of Asia was an aquaculture revolution. And again, it, the idea there was just to increase production keep increasing the yield. And um, it too made some of the same mistakes as the green revolution in terms of, you know, ripping out mangrove swamps to, to farm shrimp and um, overcrowding, you know, freshwater po uh, ponds and lakes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I use the term blue revolution a little more broadly. So it started as an aquaculture thing in, in Asia, but I say it's kind of shifted to the West and other parts of the world. And it's inclus including both the wild capture and the farmed fish because some of the technologies, some of the you know, behavioral shifts are similar. Um, so anyway, what, what the, um, that what the Nature Conservancy would say about the Blue Revolution is that, and they of course refer to it as a farming um, term as well, is that <clears throat> farming should be either nearshore shellfish and kelp, uh, offshore finfish or land-based, you know, water tanks. All the new um, finfish farms in the U.S. now basically are these land-based um, recirculating aquaculture systems which are basically um, huge tanks of water that is kind of 95% of which is purified and recirculated. And um, so the jury is still a little bit out on the economics of those systems, but um, <clears throat> it does remove a lot of the issues of the um, environmental issues from the ocean and you know, in a much more controlled environment on land. But they're very high tech, <clears throat> Um, kind of wastewater systems or life support systems, uh, highly automated with machine learning and sensors and um, automatic feeding. And uh, so there's probably more, you know, technology going into the farming than there is into the wild capture at the moment. And you, you mentioned the scientists. And I think that, you know, by and large, the people doing the farming, it, it's very different they're very different people than the fishermen who are hunters basically. And uh, the farmers are more likely to be entrepreneurs or, and or scientists. And um, 
and younger and um, many more women. I mean, obviously in, in, in the wild capture hunting, there are very few women, except in you know, artisanal Pacific uh, African fisheries, you know, near shore, a lot of women. But um, so they're, again, two very different stories, the wild capture and the, and the farm. Do you, what do you really see emerging? Do you see a, a local blended mix or, or is it really all, all those things need to occur at the same time? I mean, what are you seeing? Because we, t we tend to get in this silo. So we find something that works. We extract it until it's dead or gone. And then we move to the next silo. Uh, do you see that shifting kind of more into ecosystems or into the way we we, we change not only how we farm, but also how, how we eat, which influences that as well? Yeah, well, I, I do think that, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the, the old um, saying was that friends don't let friends eat farm fish. Um, I think now, you know, and increasingly <clears throat> fish are seen as fish, whether they're farmed or wild. And um, <clears throat> obviously some people still have their biases and, uh, their emotional reaction to either or both. But um, the, the, the big shift is getting coastal communities to accept both because <clears throat> in coastal communities that are fishing you know, communities, um, it's very hard to accept the idea of farmed fish coming in, even if it's not competing directly with the fish that they're catching. <clears throat> but it's like, um, it's seen as undercutting um, their territory. So <clears throat> I think that um, there's certainly a lot of that going on in Maine now in, in, the, U in, New in the US, which has got you know, you know, a, a long history of you know, lobster and clamming and ground fishing. And um, now the <clears throat> farms are coming in and um, so there's a battle for the you know spatial planning on the water. There's a battle for the water. There's a there's a battle on land because you know people don't want it in their backyard. So, but it's being worked out, and I think that um, it's basically I think a good thing because for coastal communities, I mean, it's an economic um, revitalization to have you know a new form of science based technology based. Um, farming come into, you know, communities, as many of which have lost a lot of fishing boats over the last two decades. So, um, you know, it would be interesting to see how this pl that plays out over the next couple of decades. But, um, and the other thing about the, um, the, uh, the farming, it doesn't even have to be on the coast. With the recirculating aquaculture systems, there's a a uh, big salmon farm in Wisconsin, one in Indiana. Um, they can be anywhere. There's fresh, you know, fresh water, um, you know. Aquaculture, source. Yeah, yeah, sources. Yeah, so, that, um, um, I'm saying a lot of that as well. And um, you, you talk in, your, in, in the book as well about rat, RAS and, and some other um, onshore um, fish farms, basically. Um, they're... There, I want I want to stick with the ecosystem a little bit for for just one more second. So, in in chapter four, you talk about eating with the ecosystem. You know that there there are mm. abundant and sustainable species. Um, I've been learning more and more, or hearing more and more. I don't know if I'm I'm learning. I haven't really um, seen all the numbers and been been able to be, but that um, so some people say the only sustainable uh, fish to eat is a, a carp, you know, and, and things like that. And I've heard, I've heard mm -hmm. absolutely crazy things. Um, and, and so it's sometimes really hard, hard to believe. And you've even had some, some models, you know, assume that it's illegal or it's bad and then prove it wrong that, that it is in the end, how are our, we taking these uh, local catch CSFs and and also both the fishermen into this sustainable fish movement and and does it really exist? Is it not just specific spots of the world, but is it emerging all over as well? 
Well, the, um, you know, it definitely lags behind the, the foodie locavora movement and the community supported agri agriculture, but it is growing really fast. I think now in the US, there are 500 or more local catch just, you know, drop points. And, um, and, you know, as you say that there is more and more emphasis on um, and demand for, for fish that is local and fresh, even if that <clears throat> fish is flash frozen and shipped, it was still considered kind of local and yeah. fresh. Um, <clears throat> that is not kind of your iconic cod, shrimp or salmon, but, um, you know, <clears throat> redfish or pollock or hake or fluke or monkfish or skate. Uh, there are all these other species that are um, very plentiful now because they've not been sought after by, they haven't been high value fish. But of course their value is increasing now as some of the other fish are, are declining. Um, and there's certainly a lot of, you know, effort, you know, most fish in, many, probably in Europe and the US, not so much in uh, <clears throat> Africa and Asia, but most fish is eaten in restaurants and not cooked at home. Now there's a big movement to, to teach people how to cook these unknown, unloved species. And um, <clears throat> so that movement is definitely, um, definitely growing. And there's more, um, you know, producers, fishermen selling direct to consumers. And of course, not everyone is going to want to do that because it's like a different business almost. Um, requires, you know, <clears throat> setting up a new system. Um, but that's also another very positive thing because you know it 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 connects people to the the product and to the person catching or producing that product, as, as opposed to just this global commodity that has traveled the world you know, five, 10,000 miles. I mean, there's some fish that is, you know, caught in the US, frozen, shipped overseas for processing, refrozen, shipped back, ends up in the supermarket. And, you know, <clears throat> you, it's probably not the best tasting <laughs> piece of fish and you can find that. So I think that's part of the reason. And you, know, you talk about the traceability that you're, you're involved with. And if people knew that was where their fish was coming from. If they could see that traceability blockchain on the packaging, they would <laughs> they would think twice. They would go down to the their local, or they'd order. Even if they lived, you know, that a thousand miles from the ocean, they'd order frozen fish, which is one interesting thing that you really can't do with vegetables, right? You can't really freeze and ship vegetables. You've got to be on the spot. <laughs> but the um, yeah, the, the fish, uh, you know, the Alaska is shipping fish all over the world now. And it's, you know. Yeah, they are. Um, um, I remember 20 years ago, you know, it'd be really exclusive. People would take trips up to Alaska to go fishing and, mm. and bring stuff back and ship it back. It's really become a crazy thing. Now you don't even need to go up there to do it anymore. They just, you just order it online. They ship it down and. And it's uh, j just, you know, a big other thing that we deal with in, in our food systems is we're shipping things uh, exorbitant miles across the world. And it's just um, just not the best, best method. The, the other thing is, is we're shipping stuff that's local elsewhere, thousands of miles just to be processed or refrozen mm -hmm. or, or, you know, and then to just be shipped right back. And in regular agriculture, you know, we have commodity crops and things that, that you know, they'll, they'll uh, sell this many potatoes to Russia and then that many potatoes they'll buy from somewhere else to, to bring in. And it's just not this local food web any, anymore. And it's, um, it's really not, I wouldn't say a scandalous, but if you cheapen food and you, you start adding mm -hmm. tons of miles mm -hmm. on it, it's just you're cheapening life. So I, I really, um, you know, in, the, in this eating, eating uh, 
like your ecosystem, like the fish would eat, that I think is is a pretty mm-hmm. good model. Mm-hmm. Have you seen really positive things come out of that? I mean, I, I there throughout your book, I think there's at least <coughs> four four or more different just examples of how it's positive. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, and it, you know, really changed during the pandemic too, I think, because, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, fishermen did not have, um, you know, restaurants were closed and that's was kind of where their product went. And there was a lot of really kind of interesting and uh, um, encouraging experimentation going on with selling direct, selling right on the docks, people coming down to buy right off the boat or, or um, you know, freezing and shipping, um, um, selling through local farmers markets, which is, you know, mostly vegetables and other things, but fish going into the farmers markets. So, and often, you know, unusual fish, not, not, you know, so, so I, I don't know, you know, Americans are so, most of what they eat is, um, farmed shrimp and salmon from around the world and um, tuna from around the world. <clears throat> so um, that's going to change <laughs> somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I live in Hamburg, Germany, which is a harbor town. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fresh fish markets. So every morning, you know, real early, I think it starts something like four thirty five in the morning. Mm. There's the fish markets open every day and people usually, uh, especially on the weekends, they go party and then just party through and then get, a, you know, just go right down to the, to the docks, to the fish market mm. and buy, mm. you know, freshly caught fish. But there's a lot of uh, mm. fish markets around here where you can pick out your, your fish. Is that, um, is that always the freshest when you're, when you're going to these fish, uh, uh, what do they call this? A fish market, I guess, is what you call it. Um, mm-hmm. Is that the 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 best bit, best way to do it? <clears throat> to go to a local fish market? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, again, it depends on how long <clears throat> the fish has been, how long ago the fish was caught, and um, <clears throat> how well it was handled. I mean, I, that's the other thing that is really, I think, changing a bit is. Um, people are experimenting with ways to increase, improve the handling of the fish so that it maintains, you know, its firmness and its taste for longer. And that it becomes a higher value product that you can charge more for. So that's the other kind of movement that is, you know, in the post-industrial sphere is to increase the value rather than the volume. Um, Increasing the value of the product, you know, lessens the fishing pressure because you don't have to catch as many fish. And um, it uh, increases the value to the consumer. And and of course that connection is very important. And I mean, it, it, it improves the connection and actually sometimes creates the connection because people say this is really you know high value in certain places now they're using this uh, technique called ikajime the japanese technique of uh, spinal you know tapping to kill quickly so that there's no fight in the fish and it creates a much you know better tasting longer lasting fish uh, and Iceland is doing something very interesting that is spreading around the world or beginning to is this 100% utilization of fish because, you know, we talked about the waste from bycatch, but there's also waste from a, you know, a prize fish, even a codfish, um, 40% of it is just, you, you know, you know, innards and bones and head and stuff that is often just thrown away. And Iceland is doing an incredible job of developing businesses to use all parts of the fish. And again, that's increasing the value to the fishermen, which re- reduces the pressure, the uh, fishing pressure on on, uh, on the catch. Is that part of the Iceland ocean cluster that you talk it about is, in the book? By, yes, started by Thor Sigfusson at Iceland ocean cluster. 
there's now um, in New England alone, there's um, three ocean clusters that are spinoffs of the Iceland one. And uh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, there was a new bill just introduced in um, Congress a couple of weeks ago requiring the um, uh, Department of Commerce to develop ocean clusters in every region of the country. So I don't know if that bill will pass, but <clears throat> it's clearly an idea that is um, gaining currency. Yeah, I, I, it's also, um, mm. what's is, I, I, it's kind of this localization idea, is the fish available, is it fresh? It's these mm. local, this, it's almost like local economies <clears throat> around, uh, mm. around fish and fishing which I really like. Uh, I used about 20 years ago, I used to live in, mm. or maybe even more than 20 years ago in Beverly, Massachusetts, the same mm. thing. Mm. You get a lot of lobster and fresh fish um, uh, there. And, and uh, one thing my family used to like these, these salmon burgers and they were, you know, they were mixed of, of obviously salmon and, and fr uh, uh, um Mm -hmm. uh, Atlantic salmon, I guess. I don't know, some kind of salmon. And they, mm -hmm. they but they only had them a certain amount of times. And you really had to go down. And it was, you, you just knew, okay, well, if I get there soon enough, or if I call mm -hmm. on the phone and say, save me some, mm -hmm. you're going to have them. But it wasn't always available. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't thing that you could just say, mm -hmm. nope, I'm always going to have it available. And you also back then paid a premium for it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I like mm -hmm. these these ocean clusters and that you say, okay, well, no, it's not always going to be available. And it depends on where you live and where you're at in the world. Um, and I think that will also allow the time for the industry and our oceans to kind of regenerate and recoup and kind mm. of restore some of these uh, where we're having bycatch problem or overfishing and um, where it's creating a lot of a lot of problems around the world so I, I i love that so there are u.s clusters ocean clusters kind of emerging what you what you're saying but um there's another kind of thing that you go into in chapter one where you talk about this uh cod survey technique and uh which has also been derived from the scallop survey technique and so it's such a complex system with specific on the type of seafood or, or uh, shellfish that you're talking about on, on what you, what the tools that are emerging that you use, you almost have to be a scientist to, to understand it all. Mm -hmm. What, what, uh, and I guess you specifically spoke about Kevin Stokesby. So how is that technology or the technique emerging and, um, it is you know that's that's this um you also talked about the japanese way of killing and handling fish that mm. how do we find mm. out about these besides reading your book how does just the regular consumer know where the sustainable fisheries and sources and clusters are um well i you know um <clears throat> a lot of people have relied on the monterey bay aquarium they've got a little I think I've got one in my wallet, a little cheat sheet on which fish are <laughs> sustainable. So, um, no, what you're talking about, the um, Kevin Stokesbury, who is a scientist at um, uh, UMass um, School for uh, Marine Science and Technology, started out in, you know, in the late 90s when the scallop um, uh, grounds were basically closed. Um, dragging underwater cameras at the bottom of the seafloor to take pictures and to show the clusters of scallops developing. And it allowed the, uh, the, the regulators to say, okay, um, and they worked, he worked with NOAA and the regulators on this and they had different survey techniques, but allowed them to open up the beds and to see, you know, where the scallops were of you know mature adult size and could be taken versus the small, or where they were um, pro proliferating or not, and um, but it's obviously easier with scallops, which don't really move. You just drag a camera on the bottom, you can see them, and you <clears throat> it's much more difficult with um, you know fin fish that are swimming. So what he's done there is a similar technique, but he's got a, a trawl net that is open ended on both ends. 
<clears throat> so you're not capturing the fish. The fish are swimming through the net and there are cameras in the net that record um, the fish going through. And th this is what I was referring to earlier. Then there's a machine learning algorithm that you know identifies the species and the size and so forth. And, um, and so it's another way of surveying the stock without doing the deep water trawl or without dragging up the fish. And, um, and the hope there is, and there are now, you know, say 350 boats in New Bedford Harbor, and a lot of them have got sensors on them to detect, you know, the salinity, the ox oxygen level, the acidity of the, of the ocean, and connect that to where they're finding the fish. And so the combination of that and the, the camera technique I just described, you know, eventually they're hoping that it just would be a way for people to, as they're fishing, to see what is coming into the net, <clears throat> connect it to the ocean, you know, characteristics of that spot, which will help them target, you know, the fish they're looking for, rather than just fishing randomly and filling their nets with. So that will help the, the bycatch, that will put the target on, on the on the right species and um, will also give people better, it, it'll be a more uh, efficient way to fish. The fishermen will have more data, you know. So that, that really gets us into a couple other things. So where, where we're moving to or what, what has emerged, farmed uh, fish, sailfish, mm. mm. sea greens, aquaculture, it's really one of the fastest growing forms of, of, of food production in the world right now. And it's just, everybody's got it on their tongue and really talking about it. Also, Atlantic salmon farming is big in this RAS that we've kind of tickled upon. Mm. And that, can you help us understand that? I mean, pe people hear about mm. it. We hear, uh, um, you know, that, that, that they're doing it. I've been involved in some of them as well, but most people are just kind of, they don't know about it. They don't know that there's these other types and, and is it controversial as we hear? Well, <clears throat> the RAS is not, um, <clears throat> I don't think it's that controversial. Um, there have been some communities that don't want, you know, plants built in their neighborhoods, but that's a different People don't like change in their neighborhoods, <laughs> no yeah. matter what it is. It's not as controversial as the original salmon farming in Norway, which had all kinds of problems. The RAS actually solves a lot of the problems. It takes it out of the ocean. There's no chance of escapement. You know, there was all that, always that fear that farm fish would escape and then breed or introgress with wild fish and reduce their survival skills and so it solves all those problems. And um, I, I think the real issue is just the economics of it. There, it's A lot can go wrong with these systems, right? They're huge life support systems. And you know the salmon take two or three years to grow out. You gotta keep them alive for a long time. And you've got, you, know, you start them in fresh water, which salmon spawn in, and then they go into salt water. So you've got two different systems there. So it's really the economics for the, um, you know, for the for the um, for the operator. I can't, you know, it's um, uses a lot of electricity, a lot of water, and <clears throat> if something goes wrong, you can lose a lot of fish fast. So I think I those are the. <laughs> I love that you bring that up. So I, I do a lot with uh, mm. vertical farming or what we call controlled environmental agriculture. Mm. It's very, it's very similar. I also do a lot with cellular agriculture, which is kind of lab grown uh, lab based meats. So I love the concept of, of RAS recirculating uh, fish and, and having these fisheries that uh, in theory are, are kind of a controlled environment of growing fish. The things that you just said are spot mm -hmm. on. Uh, high energy costs, high operation costs, because the system has to be pretty robust as a fresh water tank, a salt water tank. How do you feed them? Uh, then there's also um, different 
in, in controlled environmental agriculture, they have pathogens that come in, they could have pests that come in, they could have mold come in the system. Well, the same thing mm. can happen with a RAS system as well. The thing that I really like that I'm not seeing emerging in these new innovations and in technologies like RAS or like um, um, controlled environmental agriculture or vertical farming is that no one is really doing it 100% the right way, which, which I mean, I, I believe strongly if we um, use renewable energy, we use battery backups, we, cr we harvest our own rainwater or, and ambient water for the fresh water, we um, get some salt water um, and do the things in a controlled environment, whether it's RAS or vertical farming or controlled environment or agriculture, to keep the pathogens out, to maintain that they're not overcrowded, that they're not getting these uh, things that, that occur. It's actually a better business model because mm -hmm. you don't have that high overhead. You're not paying high, high prices for your water, for your energy, for your storage, because it's a closed system and it's generating that, which reduces your costs of goods sold mm. so that you can be competitive at, at market. I know a lot of RAS operations that are charging a pretty premium price for their products because of, of that high setup, that high initial cost. And there's a sweet spot of scale on, on some of these operations and a high turnout requirement so that they can recoup that initial setup process. But if they chose a different model, I think it would be a different system. And so I love that you bring that up, but have you seen any, any transitions in this area where, with those who say, hey, you know, it's, an, it's, an all, uh, it's a resilient way to, to do it on land, to not mess with, with our oceans, um, but there are some better models of doing it more effectively? Well, I mean, they're all talking about, um, you know, using solar panels and biofuels to run their plants because they realize the electricity is a huge, huge issue. Uh, the other thing that's really encouraging, I think, is, you know, the, the um, <clears throat> beginning of hydroponics, you know, using some of the the fish water then to go into the greenhouses uh, to grow vegetables, which is they're doing in Wisconsin, huge, you know, leafy green greenhouses with- Yeah, they call that often. aquaponic systems. The, I love yeah. that. Uh, hydroponics, yeah, the-, the Aquaponics. Uh, aquaponics, right, yes, yeah, correct. Aqua. Um, and there's one in, uh, there's a steelhead farm in New York state that is growing hemp that way which is a higher value crop than a leafy green vegetable. Um, but so I, and that also, you know, improves the economics of the systems. And, you know, you know from a food uh, perspective, it's great because, um, you know, in fact, the guy in, um, in uh, John Ng in uh, Hudson Valley Farms in New York state says that, you know, what he's doing, he could do anywhere. He could basically do it in a in a desert, because once you, you only need a certain amount of water, and once you've got that, you can just keep reusing it, and you can you can you can grow all kinds of stuff. You can grow the fish and all kinds of other vegetables or hemp or anything, and um, so that's kind of a you know a brave new world, a brave new idea. I mean, you know, I think Israel is probably doing things like that in their desert. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. This, um, you have a chapter that's uh, after one of the old, old books of, of uh, that's close to my heart, Fish for a Small Planet. Oh, yeah. There, right. You know, <laughs> Frances Moore Lapish, she's mm -hmm. also been on the podcast. She wrote the book Diet for a Small Planet. And um, mm. I think it's, it, it's so true. Fish for a small, small Planet. How do we do it different? How do we use RAS? How do we use... Other, uh, other opportunities that are more regenerative, more sustainable. Um, and well, you know, the reason, just, I, um, the reason yeah. I uh, use that title for that chapter is because Josh Goldman, who started the first RAS in the US to grow barramundi in the early 90s, was a, um, had read 
diet for a small planet in high school. So he had that kind of mindset. And then he was working with this um, group called, or he was influenced by this group called bio shelters, which again is kind of like the holistic closed system that you're talking about. But he was doing it as a college student. He was doing it uh, in this greenhouse. He was growing uh, tilapia, I think, to begin with. And then he, uh, anyway, he um, ended up, he's in Vietnam now. He's, and he's kind of gone from the RAS, which is still in operation in Massachusetts, <clears throat> you know, uh, to doing barramundi in the ocean off Vietnam. So <laughs> he's had quite a uh, uh, interesting aqua aquaculture career. And, and do you, would you call that more of like a, a, a movement into a more mm. regenerative or permaculture type of practice, but on the seas? I mean, where he's now doing it in a different way, or is it just far, uh, um, like a form of farm fishing in, in, in the seas or off the coast where they quarantine off these areas? Yeah, well, he does, he does the spawning on land in tanks <clears throat> and, you know, getting the fish up to certain size or age, then puts them in net pens in the ocean. And I think, you know, you know, the high cost that we were just talking about, it's one of the issues and one of the reasons he made the switch is because you obviously in the ocean, you don't have those high costs of electricity. You have other issues, you have to be able to monitor it and get to it and so forth. But um, so I think, Part of it was just the business model. He felt to scale the way he wanted to scale, it would be more efficient to farm in the ocean rather than on land. Absolutely. I mean, you can ask him about that, but I think that was his rationale. <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah. Um, I, there, it made me kind of think about uh, another. Um, another kind of not innovation, but another great organization, the Crab Bank in Thailand. Have you heard about any of those? They have these great crab mm. banks in Thailand. They were losing all their, their crabs and, and blue crabs, and it was just bad. And it was also affecting uh, tiger sharks and, and, and it kind of having a ripple effect in their, their uh, local fishing areas and their biodiversity which is kind of like a real in, in, intricate web. What they would do is <clears throat> whenever the, um, the, the, the fishermen and the crab catchers would go out and crab, uh, catch a crab that had obviously was very visible that they had a bunch of eggs, they would bring them to the crab bank and they had all these paint buckets that with bubbling water and they would keep them in there until they're ready to hatch. And then as they're ready to hatch, they kind of um, go out to a protected area and they re-release, you know, millions of billions of eggs at, at a time. And it's really brought back the entire ecosystem of that area in Thailand. It's off of, uh, uh, I think it's Chantaburi or mm. yeah, is the name of the place, Chantaburi in Thailand is the location, but it's a fabulous project and it's really just done a lot for the locals, for the whole community to, to have projects like that. So I, I really love that. Now, we, we, you touch upon it a little bit, but not, not quite a bit. A lot of our problems are, are uh, created now with plastics, pure ocean water, uh, phytoplankton being, being um, an issue, but also how much uh, algaes and kelp and, and mussels and oysters can really clean up our, not only our air and, and our oceans and, and do a lot of good and, and create other project products, that that's all kind of emerging out. And you talk about scallops and all, all sorts of other, scallops, mussels, oysters, clams and, and other things. Um, <clears throat> that's a whole nother web that's that's opening up. And, and so I, I want to go into that, but I kind of want to caveat at first with a, a question. You did a lot for MIT and MIT back in 1972 came out with the books, The Limits to Growth. 
and Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, who lives kind of close to Hampton, New Hampshire, is close to Boston, Massachusetts. Um, um, uh, and your granders and Steve Barron's who worked at MIT on the world model three, which is a systems model thing and the systems thinking concept and, and the webs and later created a lot of dynamic models on uh, fisheries on seafood webs and how the inputs, the stock takes in those was any of that since you did some work at MIT or any of that, was that kind of an influence for you to see this bigger web of what's going on in your work and that? Well, <clears throat> no, not really. Um, <clears throat> but I did start thinking about, you know, <clears throat> fishing in general as a very complex system itself, you know, much more complex than the average person thinks it is because they just react to overfishing or bad or, but it's a very complex system. And once you begin to tweak one part of it, you inevitably affect other parts of it. <clears throat> so the MIT work, I, I, I've heard of that. I've never studied that or read that, but I did start to think of fishing in both farmed and wild as very complex systems that, um, it's very easy to, to have, you know, unintended consequences. <laughs> and, you know, one being, you know, I mentioned earlier, just the consolidation, you know, the regulations and the quotas that have been good for the fish in terms of protecting the resource have been bad for the fishermen. And because it's, they're losing boats, they, they, they don't get quota, they can't afford the permits. And so um, that's an example of, you know, making a, change to a system that affects, you know, the people in the system. Um, yeah, so the, um, uh, yeah, the, the shellfish and the kelp that you mentioned, as you know, I mentioned the Nature Conservancy said that 70% of the marine or the mariculture is bivalves and kelp, and it's very restorative. Um, you know, it cleans up near shore waters, it, it excess nitrogen and, and uh, kelp is a buffer against CO2, it absorbs CO2. And there've been in, in, you know, Maine mussel farmers will tell you that it, growing kelp and mussels together or in cr close proximity, the mussel shells are much stronger and grow faster because they're not getting this, the acidity is being absorbed by the kelp and it means the meats grow plumper and faster because the acidity is a, is a major concern on shell building and more so with mussels than oysters even. It's a thinner shell. Um, you mentioned phytoplankton and you know, there are worries that the, the phytoplankton, you know, they're small organic, I mean, microorganism like um, vegetable matter at the bottom of the seafood chain of the food chain in the ocean. You know, the phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton are eaten by the little forage fish are eaten by the bigger fish. But the phytoplankton are declining in numbers and they have less energy than they used to. And by energy, meaning energy from the sun, because they use photosynthesis, they absorb carbon dioxide, and they have chlorophyll, they emit oxygen, more than 50% of the world's oxygen comes from these little minuscule <laughs> uh, organisms. And um, so there's a worry that with climate change, uh, <clears throat> there's less upwelling of nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to feed the phytoplankton. There's less energy then being transferred uh, into the forage fish, less energy transferred into the larger fish. Um, so, yeah, so the whole climate change thing is, you know, is another issue that we talk about is one of the global challenges, which are, is kind of confounding. I mean, it's a challenge for all walks of life and regions, but um, <clears throat> obviously a big impact on the oceans too. The warmer water um, holds less oxygen and makes it harder for large fish in particular to swim. And at a time when they need to exert more energy to get their food, because there's less energy in the foods. So it's a kind of a, a confounding cycle. 
I spoke to you about my book, Menu B, and, and asked for your advice. And thank you, by the way, on, on, on some things around fishing, some, some other authors and experts. The one, one big aspect is our, our global food systems very, has this complexity and, and the systems in it. But more and more, it's this big web of life that's always interconnected to, to many other parts of the world, many other parts of the ocean and land as well. And even there's even uh, so much land and uh, dust storms and tropical storms over the Amazon that really also through diatoms feed those uh, phytoplankton uh feed mm. the oceans create the blue algaes create these blooms in, in the oceans that really uh you see this big cycle of life moving around that's not just only in the blue part of our our world but also in the sand part of our world that uh seeds clouds causing them to rain and then drop that food and nutrients back into the oceans and into the water to feed phytoplankton and to create diatoms to create algae blooms to create a feeding frenzy for for fish or to create food for fish and we sometimes don't see that big connection of these complex web systems but how much we're affecting that um, through the in this anthropocene that we're in by human actions the way we we treat the world um, you know some recent studies as a matter of fact it was just yesterday I heard that, you know, every day or every week we're eating about a credit card worth of plastic mm. every week, mm. just in, in the food that we eat and that they found plastic in human blood now and, and things like that. Mm. And we definitely know it's in our oceans and, and degrading, turning into microplastic and that the seafood can't distinguish it from phytoplankton, from microplankton. Uh, um, or plastic. And so somehow it's getting into our food system in that big chain of life. Um, that is something that, you know, I didn't address that in the book. I thought about it a couple of times, but I was having enough trouble keeping yeah. up with everything else. Um, but I know for some people, they won't eat fish because they say there's microplastics out there and I don't want to eat it. Yeah, and there was a lot of talk about it at the um, North American Seafood Expo that I went to last month. And yeah, it's clearly a huge issue. And again, it's kind of like climate change. I mean, how, you know, what has been done is going to take 50 years, even if everything stopped today, it would be another 50 years, probably at least of um, dealing with the uh, kind of downstream effects. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And it's not just, I mean, don't ever want to blame it all on, on, uh, the fish or that, because it's also the animal agriculture, mm. uh, and a lot of the, our grains and feedstock, believe it or not, they're taking old food waste, uh, bread packages and, and many other things with the plastic still on it. And they're just grinding it up and putting it into animal feed. And those animals are eating that. And so, um, there's just bad practices out there that uh, aren't sustainable. They're not regenerative. They're bad farming practices. They're driven by low cost of high per industrial production of food or fishing, wherever it is. And I'm, I love what your book brings out is this really this shift. And let's get it digitized. Let's get it into the information age. Let's have some accountability, some measurability, some transparency where we can see what's happening and let's let the not put the onus on the consumer, but let's have them make the choice of what they want to eat, where they got, want to get it, which should push uh, more value and more um, local um, accountability and uh, profitability to those in industries in that market, they say, no, our, our consumers will pay more for a better product, one that's not full of, of bad, bad practices um, and kind of do that reformation or, or change the way we do it. Because in the end effect, it's really about 
the long-term sustainability or regeneration of those supply changes of those products. If we keep doing this extractive and let's just overfish and, and bycatch and deplete until nothing's left, then nothing's left. So we've got to figure out how can we work in that ecosystem to, to, to make sure it's around for future generations of humanity in a good way. Um, because fish is when it's done right and when it's uh, when it's not full of plastics or bad things, then it, it's a beautiful thing to have, you know. Mm. So, um, and I love the the fact that you also mentioned. Let's teach people how to to cat to cook and and do these other species that they've probably never heard of before because they're used to fish sticks and cod or certain types of uh, uh, salmon or or trout, but they've never tried Victoria Barsh or Rote Barsh or, you know, many, many other fabulous uh, types of fish. And yeah, food. no, I, you're, I think you're <clears throat> exactly right that the, um, you know, the consumer, it's so easy to, to put the blame on the producers all the time. And producers obviously don't do everything right, but the consumer has a big role to play in this as well, right? It's, it's the other side of the equation. And it's the demand um, that drives the production. And if um, the demand is for a different product, it will force a different type of production. And um, so then it, I guess is a question of education and information and, you know, um, getting the word out and so forth. But um, yeah, we've seen it happen in the um, in the in the uh, land-based agriculture. So hopefully, it will happen and is happening in um, the ocean-based uh, aquaculture as well. So the, you you also one of your chapters, the Holy Grail of, of farming the open seas. You talk about you know what the United States is doing, what kind of equipment and sensors, what kind of regulations are there, what federal agencies are are in charge of farming in, in federal waters. Um, that's complex in, in itself, but there's this thing you talk about, the seafood print metric. Mm. How mm. does that compare to the carbon footprint metric that we've kind of mm. heard and heard a lot about? Can you tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> well, that is from um, <clears throat> Daniel Pauley and the sea around us at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And uh, Daniel Pauly is, you know, one of the world's leading, most esteemed marine biologists, um, who always has interesting ways of looking at the world and framing the issues. And um, <clears throat> so he says that basically um, the seafood print is a way of measuring the amount of fish that you're, if you eat a pound of the way, the way he puts it is a, a pound of um, tilapia is very different than a pound of tuna because a pound of tuna has at the top of the food chain, the tuna has eaten so many other, you know, uh, types of fish have gone into that pound of tuna, whereas the tilapia is like a, a herbivore, basically at the very close to the bottom of the food chain. So, and he's, you know, he says that Americans really are, I don't know if they're leading the world, but they're close to the top of the world in the seafood print because we like the high, uh, the, um, the fish that are high in the food chain, you know, the tuna and the, and the salmon, you know, the real carnivores. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So it's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, I agree. And, and I mean, his, his point, because he's very, um, uh, always very cognizant of the impact in other parts of the world and artisan, artisanal fisher, fisher ease and fisher people, uh, you know, and that if, if the rich countries are sucking all of this huge, you know, amount of seafood with every bite, it's just taken away from other, you know, people in other parts of the world. And so uh, it's a, he's a very uh, innovative uh, thinker in that regard. The, the last kind of uh, 
book, you know, and some respects could be a little bit depressing um, question that I have for you is really, how does the level of marine extinctions compare to our terrestrial extinctions to put that in to perspective for our audience since we usually don't see what's underwater so <clears throat> right well um there have been no marine extinctions in the last 50 years scientists say although they also say that a lot of the data is deficient because there's a lot going on <laughs> in the ocean that we don't know about um <clears throat> and the way they um phrase it is that um, we're kind of at the stage of uh, marine extinctions or at the stage that terrestrial extinctions were at um, in the Pleistocene era, I believe. You know, when, the, when <clears throat> people first really started um, hunting and, and er eradicating species. So that in itself is kind of positive. And, um, and if you look at you know, the beginning of the industrial revolution, um, where terrestrial extinctions were really accelerated after the industrial revolution. So the fear is that, you know, if the ocean is industrialized, with, you know, wind power and seabed mining, and whatever else that it could create a surge of um, extinctions. But yeah, for the yeah, moment, it's, it's yeah, positive. Yeah. Given yeah, the fact it sounds the, very positive. The caveat that the it. data is deficient in some areas. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's also, you know, ocean acidification and, and uh, the bleaching and the, the, you know, the warming and things. And, and you know, but we, we don't, we don't, fully know what all the effects of that could be or will be and mm. and how that will play out um but i've also seen some real positive things where they've seen some smaller local ecosystems bounce back like i was telling you with the crab bank and and some other areas mm. um so that so that's nice to hear well you know the other I've, the, other, the that, other thing is that um it, it fish have shown to have an incredible capacity to rebuild and there have been lots of examples of it. If you leave them alone and um, stocks will rebuild and um, ocean deserts will come back to life. Uh, you know, there's what Cabo Pulmo in uh, Panama is one example. It was just kind of nothing happening. And now it's like a uh, tropical underwater jungle. And uh, I love that you know, in 20 years. So uh, that's positive. I think that's a, dip, a big difference between ocean conservation, so to say, if we want to use that term, and land conservation. So what we've seen in holistic land management and land conservation, when we quarantine or border off an area and preserve it and that, that we, we, we need some of that movement and interaction of, of herds and animals to, to leave their dung and their manure and and to kind of trod down that to get the soil back up to health, that that's actually a positive thing that whereas we quarantine humans and animals and into these preserves that they actually don't see a huge uptake and and increase of, of, of land fertility or that, that that place comes back and thrives. Whereas in the oceans, I think it's a much different beast that there's not really like, I think that that ecosystem still preserved if we just uh, leave it untouched for a while, it, it would probably bounce back, have the ability to bounce back in some respects. Well, that's the hope. And that's why, you know, there's all these kind of um, ideas um, and uh, initiatives to put X percent of the ocean into conservation, close the fishing and uh, there's now 8% 8, 8 is kind of in these kind of no-take no reserve zones. But the hope is to get up to 30% by 2030, but that seems like a stretch. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it um, and some people talk about closing off all the high seas, all the areas outside of, you know, 
every country's exclusive zone. Um, Daniel Pauly is one of those who would like to close off all the high seas to fishing. And he claims that it wouldn't really change the world catch by that much because, uh, but it would probably act as a refuge and uh, give fish uh, an opportunity to adapt to climate change among other things if they weren't trying to escape um, hunters and capture, they, they could put their energy into adaptation. Yeah, I love that, that that's nice. So I have three questions left for you. Um, this one's probably the, the hardest one that I give you. Um, it, it's kind of tied to the book, but it's not, it's more your personal view. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I mean, um, you know, that is a tough question. <laughs> well, I think, you know, a, a lot of it comes back to what I was talking about before is that this connection between producers and consumers. I think that if, you know, and there was more of a um, two-way street between the producer and the consumer, and more of an understanding of one another that things would be a lot better, you know. Um, and you can see it with some companies like Patagonia and companies like that, where there's, you know, the consumer and the producer are kind of on the same wavelength. And th that creates a, um, you know, better products, uh, uh, more, it's more sustainable, uh, um, less destructive. And so I think that would be a, a starting point. I love it. Thank you. That that's great. So, um, the last three questions are, or last two questions are really, you know, if there was one message that you could depart all, to all my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had, the power to change your life, what would it be your message? And it's okay if it's more than one message, but what's kind of your takeaway in, when you write these books and, and in, in the work that you do that you want to depart to people as a sustainable takeaway that changed their life? Um, well, I think, you know, that um, is really to just to try to understand um, you know, as you say, systems more. And because I think a lot of people jump to conclusions about things in the world or the state of affairs in the world without really knowing how things get to where they are and why they are the way they are. It just seems like that people could step back a little bit and, and really try to think about, you know, the producers, the supply chain, the, um, <clears throat> the, other, the other half of the equation that um, it, would, it would kind of illuminate their view of the world. And it's uh -huh. a hard thing to do, right? Because who's, who's, you know, in a daily busy life, you're not gonna try to understand uh, large complex systems. Um, but you can actually not take everything at face value and jump to conclusions, which I think is what, you know, is human nature and uh, is more often the case than not. Do you think you've been more at, at an advantage with um, coming kind of from the innovation side of things in some respects, or at least reporting on that, and, and also your work from MIT to kind of get a little bit more of this platforms. I mean, for technology are all run on mm. platforms, which is a very systemic type of a model, a systems type of a model. Do you think that helps you at all? Uh, well, it probably does. I mean, I guess, you know, because I've done a lot of um, writing about and thinking about entrepreneurship and technology. And I, I guess if you think of, you know, the entrepreneurs who are creating great new things are really doing um, deep thinking about, you know, what uh, is good and what um, will help the world. And um, so 
So maybe some of that has rubbed off. I don't, I don't know, but I, I, it is a different, um, you know, people who are trying to create new things from scratch, uh, is very exciting. Right. And, um, and especially if they're trying to create new things from scratch that are, you know, going to have really positive impact on, you know, large numbers of people. Love that. Yeah, I agree. Most of the pioneers or innovators I've seen are ones who are are solving a problem that they're struggling or suffering with as as well. They're like, I just, it's not working for me anymore. I need to, I need to fix that and create a new system. And mm -hmm. they've all been really super, super um, innovations that have come about that have really started to help uh, billions of people. The last question is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Hmm. Uh, I um, would have liked to have, you know, this again is kind of gets back to what I was just saying in terms of word, worldview about, you know, how to think about the world. I would have like to have been more engaged uh, with the world at large, the international world from a younger age, because um, like I, I, I like I have been in the last 20 years, but if, you know, because it definitely gives you a different perspective on, uh, on issues and a different way of thinking about things and, um, it forces you to kind of second guess your your assumptions about things because you you see them from another person's perspective. Love that, Nicholas. Thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. Uh, it's all the hard grilling questions I have for you. The, <laughs> The Blue Revolution, what a wonderful book. Uh, like I said, I read it twice. It, it was really good. It's an eye opener. It's also very hopeful. I'm optimistic because I read it, because I can see all the, the great things that are, that are emerging and coming out there. And if we um, just continue that ripple effect, that voice that they are working, they are, are positive. There's other and different, better systems out there available. To, it's not all doom and gloom that maybe we can spread that so that everybody is using those effective systems that they're learning. There are other options and things to do that new technologies that will really put us on the right side of history when it comes to seafood, our oceans and the way we do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, so much. Thank you for reading the book and um, I'm glad you liked it. And um, thanks for having me on your um your podcast, your video podcast. And um, uh, I hope you stay in touch. Thank we you. definitely will. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.